Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to PTC, uh, if this is your first time. I'd like to introduce Bob uh, Brampley. He's the Senior Managing Director of Laser Light Communications, a subsidiary of Pegasus Global Holdings. He has an extensive experience in the field of uh, mobile satellite uh, services. I'm going to keep the intro short because it's a very uh, packed presentation. He will discuss the, the progress of laser lights, hello communication network, and the concept of space uh, cable. Please help me welcome Robert Brumley. Thanks, Francis. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, first, uh, to start off and thank Joe Weinman, because, be, uh, because of Joe, I am here. Uh, laser light, I've not really presented anything officially about laser light uh, since its inception back in uh, 2012. I've made three presentations, this being one. The first one was our formal announce at the World Satellite Forum in Paris in 2012. Uh, we got some nice, interesting inquiries about it, and then we went to our work and essentially closed off any kind of public discussion about it. Then our next was at the Optical Equipment, Next Generation Optical Equipment Conference in Dallas, and that's where I saw Joe. Uh, it was closed door, no press, primarily engineers to talk about uh, the efficacy of laser communications as a medium for data transfer. Uh, Joe came up later and said this would be a great topic to bring to you. Uh, in three or four years, a lot of you uh, attending here, particularly the undersea cable carriers and the fiber optic carriers are potential customers for us. And so with that, I'd like to introduce LaserLight. The, uh, by the way, I went through that very quickly. That's the forward-looking statement. Uh, it's, too sm it's too small for you to read, but the point is, is that we're not right now in the market selling securities. Uh, laser light. What laser light is and what we intend it to be is basically going to be the first commercial global uh, all optical satellite system. Now, it's a satellite, it's a hybrid system, which means it's satellite as well as terrestrial. When I mean all optical, uh, I'm, you know, the, uh, the common phrase is lasers. Or when we use laser communications on the satellites, interconnecting with, through ground nodes, ground nodes will interconnect to the uh, terrestrial fiber network. It's three components of this system. One is the satellite system, which is referred to as the OSS, the optical satellite system. Secondly is the hybrid optical system, which is really the payloads, the star beam system, which are the payloads on the buses as well as the payloads in the ground nodes. The ground nodes are roughly a little bit smaller than these tables in here. They have three sets of uh, laser heads in each one, and they'll track, this, uh, they'll track three satellites at a time as they go across the horizon. Uh, they will, in turn, transmit that waveform into what would be the third element, and that's the ground terrestrial access system. That ground terrestrial access system is exactly the access system that fiber optic, uh, terrestrial, buried, aerial, or undersea cable go through both the equipment as well as the waveform uh, that exists today. In sum, we built the waveform, the capability, and the transmission systems to make sure they're compatible with the legacy systems we have and the systems that are coming, uh, that are coming in the future, uh, such as SDN. The, we have these, this program is a has benefited from a large expenditure by the Department of Defense on a thing called TSAT. That's the Transformational Satellite System. In TSAT, the basis of TSAT was essentially, um, I just take myself off here? Yeah. Uh, basically, TSAT was uh, two consortiums, one led by Boeing, one led by Lockheed, Ball Aerospace, Norfolk Grumman, uh, Juniper and Cisco, and that was essentially to move data between uh, four geo satellites through intersatellite links. By using uh, the intersatellite links, uh, they were able to get more capacity, more bandwidth uh, by using lasers than they would with RF. Now, the ele other element of TSAT was they were going to use RF to the ground. We've taken TSAT, modified it, slimmed it down, and turned it into what would be a satellite constellation at, in MEO, along the equatorial plane, eight to 12 satellites, and the, will be joined by inter-satellite links. Those satellite links, in turns, will push data directly and also diversely amongst uh, the satellite constellation. On board the bus will be uh, eight to 12 laser payloads, which will look down as uh, the uh, ground node comes into view on the equator, the satellite payload will pick up that ground node 
It'll basically make a link and hold it, and essentially hold that until it's about 90 degrees perpendicular to the, uh, to the satellite, and then it'll drop it. Two satellites behind it will have also acquired that same ground node. So we'll have triple redundancy at each point of presence on the Earth. They, in turn, will be connected into the terrestrial ground system. To test all that, TSAT funded test facilities. So you had basically test centers. We have just concluded what would be the rollout of our uh, test center called the HALO Center, High Articulation Laser Optics Center. It's a test center. It's in Reston, Virginia. Uh, it'll be uh, a location where you can actually come, whether you're a customer, regulator, or investor, you can come in and see in this particular area a dual, a dual uh, 100 gig ring with laser heads uh, suspended from the ceiling as well as on the ground and dynamically run our signal through that pop. Uh, we plan on basically having that pop available for uh, outside traffic. So in sum, from Singapore, you could run traffic through that, uh, that pop in Northern Virginia and know you have run it through a hybrid laser, fiber optic laser uh, loop uh, in, that, uh, in that location. Intellectual property, the IP is uh, derived from our vendors uh, under a foreground IP arrangement. We'll have that under an exclusive uh, re uh, relationship with them for about five years until we go in service. Uh, we, the core of our IP is what we call the Starbeam Network Operating System. That is really what's going to manage both satellite, terrestrial, and inter uh, interconnection into the terrestrial networks. Uh, as well as dealing with what would be the uh, network management issues associated with lasers in the atmosphere. Uh, our customer market strategy is wholesale. Uh, our view is, is it's a six terabit system uh, uh, bidirectionally. Uh, we view that uh, the, the individuals or the companies that would be interested in us would be the ones who want large blocks of uh, uh, bandwidth and be able to use it anywhere basically along their network where we deploy a ground node. So they tell us where they want the ground nodes, uh, we'll provide the ground nodes to them, and we'll provide the bandwidth to them. Uh, we're not in the business of selling circuits. Uh, regulatory, it's all lasers. We're outside the scope of RF regulation. And right now, uh, we will be regulated, but right now, uh, the FCC doesn't have a regulatory hook into us. Neither does NTIA, neither does the Laser Clearinghouse, neither does Ofcom. So we're working with those agencies to what we call find a regulatory environment that we can fit in. Uh, since mostly theirs is a concern about interference in RF, we're not RF, uh, we sort of fall outside the scope here. Uh, we've got uh, our Pegasus Global Holdings, a parent company, has been handling the investment. Uh, this is the year that we'll be basically looking at scaling our investment both in Series A as well as in Project Finance. And so now the schedule. Since 2012, uh, we have uh, finished the overall business strategy. Our regulatory, as I mentioned, is ongoing. Uh, we've got our corporate structure and management. We are a UK company, Laserlight uh, Global Limited. It owns the US company, Laserlight US. Uh, LLC, which is a Delaware, which also owns the Halo Center LLC. Uh, the, uh, we've done, we did our system design uh, back in uh, April, May. Before that, we had to determine what was the industrial base. Who can make the lasers? Who can basically build the payloads? Who can build the ground nodes? So we spent six months on essentially looking at a commercial off-the-shelf, firm fixed price community that could provide us the payloads, as well as the buses, as well as the ground nodes, uh, at a price point that made it realistic. The uh, system validation will be at the Halo Center. That'll be open in about two quarters. Uh, the financial model is done and continuing to be improved. Halo funding, as mentioned earlier, we've uh, secured a debt facility for Halo funding. Uh, and we have plans on doing some equity for HALO funding uh, in the future. Uh, customer requirements are something that we're starting to look at now. The system doesn't deploy until late 2017, so consequently we have to determine where we're going to put the nodes. Very similar to where we would put the nodes um, in a wireless system where you have to do spectrum anal analysis and interference analysis, we have to decide where we want to put our ground nodes relative to where the customer wants them. That's usually an aggregation point of fiber or undersea cable, for example in Oman, where you've got eight undersea cables that terminate, or really transit, Oman, that's a good place for us to put a node. It allows us to basically bring a lot of bandwidth to that point and then distribute it out in 100 gig service lengths uh, to, whoever, uh, uh, to whichever customer wants it. Uh, the um, uh, management recruit continues, project finance. Uh, we anticipate that this will be a combination of uh, project, uh, project finance, probably from, uh, led by an ECA, export credit agency, such as XM Bank, 
or COFAS, and, uh, and equity would be traditional private equity. Uh, then that leaves us with to build the network and basically drive the business. The structure of the company very uh, quickly is, I mentioned we're a UK company. Uh, we have three operating components, the OSS, the ground network system, and facilities and operations. Our facilities and operations will be in seven markets. Those seven markets will be driven basically by the topography uh, that is uh, benefited from the satellite system itself and where the concentration of cables and uh, undersea cables and customers would be. This is a design of what the network would look like in an equatorial orbit. Essentially, it's uh, the, um, the MEOs themselves uh, are 8 to 12. Uh, they will interconnect with GNS, that's a ground node system, which has a UNS, which is a user network interface system, and SGN happens to be the star beam ground node, which is the laser heads themselves. Those will be positioned, 48 to 96 of them, uh, around essentially the globe, and they'll be driven a lot by customer requirement. Uh, this is a description of our service and products. And if you note it and take a second to look at it, global IP network, uh, fully integrated satellite, this actually isn't mine. Uh, in, full, in full disclosure here, this came off an announcement of a major uh, uh, global IP uh, service provider, someone who's probably attending this conference. What I did was, without mentioning their name, what I did was is that this was in their public statement on a deal they had done. We qualify and fit everything they say here except one thing. We added satellite. That's the only difference is satellite. So instead of being global IP network, terrestrial service net, fully integrated terrestrial service network, blah, 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 we've added satellite because the satellite turns out to be the most highly efficient transport layer for long distance in moving big bandwidth if you're using lasers. And so that's the secret sauce here. It's not, it's not dependent on digging, it's not dependent on transport costs, it's, it jumps across huge chunks of real estate. That's always been satellite's benefit, is it has that ability to, to jump across big pieces of real estate. Here, we're basically moving it around the world. So I can go Dubai to Hong Kong, I give up some, uh, I give some uh, service away on uh, going through the atmosphere uplink, I give some away going downlink, but I make it up when I go through the vacuum of space on inner satellite link and I am as fast and as competitive in terms of speed and service delivery as fiber node to node, pop to pop, or end to end. Uh, recent developments, you know, can this really work? Well, I thank NASA for a $35 million beta trial that I don't have to pay for. This was terrific. They put up the, uh, they and MIT have had a huge success with the Lunar Laser Communications Project, part of the LADEE system. Uh, 250,000 kilometers from Earth, three global ground stations, as well as steerable beam to facilitate weather avoidance, and they're getting minimum 660 megabits at that distance. Uh, I've put some links down here uh, at the bottom of the slide for you to basically take a look at. They have one, which is a NASA administrator who is on a full video streaming f a video feed off of that laser link uh, that from that distance took them about two minutes to download. But the point is, is that our job is really to scale and commercialize what they have done and what the U.S. government has done and, candidly, what the European Space Agency has done as well. It's ready for prime time, and we're ready to bring it to you. Uh, the weather. That's the elephant in the room, and I've got four minutes to talk about the weather. Lasers do not play well in weather. And there have been a history of terrestrial laser ventures that have overpromised and underdelivered because of weather. Our business model is primarily based on one thing, avoid the weather. We're not gonna to try to burn through the weather, we're not gonna to try to reinvent the physics of what a negative dB cycle might be in the weather. What we have is the benefit of one thing that other companies have not paid attention to, and that is from satellite, I have a view of all the terrestrial networks, all of them. So consequently, all I have to do is get a connection to the terrestrial network, and if in fact I'm in Dubai, and Dubai is weather impacted based on my sensors, I'll drop it in Abu Dhabi, or I'll drop it in Oman, and I'll bring it in on fiber. Which means I have to be a partner with the fiber optic operators and the undersea cable operators. They are my redundancy and resiliency. They provide me my diverse path. It's the world turned upside down for satellite, which used to be the redundant and resilient partner for fiber. We are, in fact, looking for fiber partners to be our diverse pathway so we can deliver a 5.9 network. 
Now, we've did, we did an atmospheric study, thanks to Norfolk Grumman, to uh, essentially see what kind of on-net, off-net, and service delivery can we get using, say, four different markets, Perth, Sydney, Johannesburg, and uh, Santiago, and what's their relative weather co uh, correlation to each other? What we found, 90 plus percent on net. As long as we build mesh networks around what would be uh, our regional markets, it gives me diverse pathways to get to that final customer delivery point, I can get to uh, 90 plus percent. This is based in part the weather patterns and how they change uh, between Sydney and Perth and, and Joburg and, and Santiago, but it's also about clustering, clustering sites in these regions. So where I have local region one and I have local region two, we'll actually have seven local regions. Uh, Medmina, Mediterranean, Eastern, uh, uh, Med, uh, North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, we'll have Latin America, we'll have Africa, uh, we will have South Asia, North Asia, Western Europe, and the United States. The first ones we're building out on network topology is Medmina, Africa, and Latin America. The ability to be 90% on net in, a, in a, uh, a service delivery platform where you control the costs uh, is significant because off net and OPEX charges are really a challenge for our terrestrial uh, counterparts. Uh, the longer we go, the cheaper we are. That's sort of the model upside down for the terrestrial guys. We think that if you combine us with terrestrial, where we in fact can deliver back more margin, and at the same time use their networks for our diverse re requirements, they can use our network for long haul and not have to capex uh, or really uh, absorb uh, a great deal of opex, uh, there's a real partnership there. And that's the community we're in. Even the regulator says, you may not be RF, but you know what? Well, let's start with a 214 common carrier. We'll try to regulate you like we regulate undersea cable, how we regulate buried cable, how we regulate aerial, and instead what we'll take, we'll call you space cable. That's our footprint uh, in terms of the world. That's our footprint in terms of all the cables, uh, uh, head ends in the world. So if you see where the world basically is right now in terms of, uh, and there's some of the networks are not even on here. This is an old one from Telegeography. That gives you our coverage. That's the FCC. We're way up the channel. And that's the Halo Center. And you'll get the rest of these. Um, my time is up. So if uh, we have some time out, uh, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, out in the hallway, or at the tap of bar for that, for that matter. Thank you very much.